Our scripture today is from the Gospel of Luke. We'll be reading from the first chapter, verses 26 through 38. Hear the word of the Lord. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of oh, David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of God for all of us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. For those of you who were part of the Living Nativity a couple weeks ago, I can confirm that the conversations in between scenes were random and ridiculous. <laughs> uh, we talked about our favorite decade of music, and then it ranged from, no, what if you could you know, take two decades together, like 75 to 85, or, you know, uh, but that's the kind of things that we were talking about in between these, these scenes. Uh, first of all, I want to thank our youth band, H2O. Uh, they've only been around about a year and a half now. And Remarkable the progress they've made in such a short time. And we're also, we have kids on the sound, we have kids on the slides, and so thank you guys. We're training up a new generation, and if I can just train one of them to preach, uh, I can stand up <laughs> and watch the Center or, or watch the on TV. Um, but anyway, thank you guys so much for blessing us this morning. I was in a coffee shop this week, and there was, it was about 8 8 30 in the morning, and I walked in and uh, it wasn't very crowded, but it was getting there. There was a long line behind me. And then once I get my coffee, I see this mother with two young children. Uh, they had come out of, uh, they just around the corner, and uh, both of these toddlers, maybe two or three years old, there was two of them, uh, each one of them had an ice cream cone. An ice cream cone at 8.30 in the morning. And not only that, but the ice cream was all over their face, and it was all over their hands, and they were walking around, and they were in hot heaven. I mean, they had an ice cream cone just stopping around the coffee shop, and they were bouncing off the walls. <laughs> then I, I heard the mother say, I gotta go, I gotta get these kids off to somewhere, I gotta drop them off somewhere. So I thought, either she really doesn't like her babysitter, <laughs> or she's got some beef with her preschool teacher because she pumped them full of sugar, and she's gonna drop them off. Then, at the same time, a, a, a woman came in with a really big dog, a really big dog. And that dog apparently thought he was human. And so he, he jumped up and put his paws on the counter where everyone was ordering their coffee. And there was a glass case with a muffin in it. And he kept hitting his nose up to it. And then, to, and then he started licking the glass case. And that was when the barista said, you know, maybe we should put the dog down back on the floor. So between the dog and between these, uh, these two little kids who were running around everywhere, no one was having conversation. No one was reading. No one was writing sermons. We were all looking at these wonderful children and this dog. They were the center of attention. 
they were the thing that broke the normal, that broke the mold, and gave a kind of light to our normal routine. And that is what this video was about a moment ago. All of our conversations, all of our worries, all of our complaints begin to kind of pale in comparison to this Christ child. Uh, there's this great new podcast about the rich history of Wilmington. It's by the Star News. And uh, I've been listening to it. I'm a bit of a history guy. And, and uh, they had one this week that was really good. It was about the Christmas tree that used to be on display here in Wilmington uh, it, for about 100 years. There is this tree that was 50 feet high, 100 feet wide, that used to be lit every year in Wilmington. And back in like the 16th century, there were no Christmas decorations, there were no Christmas trees. In fact, it was just becoming a tradition among the Germans to bring in a tree from outside, to place it in your home, and then to put like fruit and cookies, and then they would do this strange thing where they would situate a candle on the tree in such a way where it wouldn't burn the tree down, but they wanted to find a way to light the tree. Now, this was a German tradition, but it didn't really spread to the rest of the world. In fact, in the rest of the world, and especially America, that was sacrilegious. That was a heathen thing to do. There, there are no decorations. There are no trees around Christmas. That would be a distraction from Christ. Now, you, you celebrate Christ in church. Don't decorate your home with all of that stuff. And then one day, as so happens even today, the, queen, the king and queen of England were seen bringing in a Christmas tree and lighting it up. That was in the mid-19th. And then once the king and queen of England did it, it began catching on throughout the rest of the world. Not just with the Christmas tree, but all kinds of other decorations too. And then, as it became popular in, in America, it was discovered that here in Wilmington, there was one very special tree. And at one point in the early 20th century, Wilmington had the largest living Christmas tree. Yeah, I don't know if you, any Wilmingtonians who grew up here, you, you may know this. But they would, back in, and this is even before World War II, they would actually light it up with these big light bulbs. And they weren't nearly as safe as they are now. And they would put a speaker inside of the tree. And they would actually blare Christmas music out of that with the lights. And then after World War II, as America is getting back to, the, the, to, to really joy again, as they're trying to bring back the good Christmas cheer because they didn't have a Christmas tree during the war, it became a national news story. There was national news at the lighting of the Christmas tree in Wilmington. And they had 40 Santas there that day. And they, they had over 7,000 lights on this big, giant tree. And Chris, there's a, 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 actually, there's a picture of it. Yeah, this is what it looked like back then. A really big tree. It's not there anymore, so don't find it. Uh, but it was a big national news that we were having this big Christmas tree lighting in the 1950s. And, and actually, this tree hung around until very recently uh, because of the ice storms and hurricanes and all of the lights and the speaker hanging on. Uh, this tree, which basically kind of withered away at 400 years old, they basically retired in 2012. And so that's not there anymore. But this became, in Wilmington, the, the largest uh, uh, living Christmas tree in America, which is a unique distinction that we have. So one thing that people decided along the way in celebrating Christmas is that they wanted inside of their home a kind of focal point, something that would glow a little bit, something similar to the Christmas story. And whether they did it consciously or subconsciously, they wanted something in their home that would glow. How many of you enjoy putting on your Christmas tree and turning on the lights and turning out all the other lights and letting that be the only thing that shines in your room? That's actually very similar to the inception of Christmas itself. The story that Emily read this morning is about a young teenage girl who was in her home by herself and all of a sudden, poof, this big, bright, glowing person came into her room in the middle of the darkness. Uh, Chris, if you could show that the other picture there. I think we, if you go to uh, Nazareth today, uh, this, is where, this is where Mary's uh, room was. Uh, if you go to Nazareth today, this is what you can see. The foundations of Nazareth are actually still there today. You can, they're only about this high because they've been you know, torn down uh, from years of, of, of everything. Uh, 
But this is preserved because Christians have, uh, tradition has said this is where Mary lived. And she actually, go to the other picture, Chris. Uh, you can find it there. Uh, yeah, you can sort of see that Mary kind of, she didn't live in a hut or anything like that. She didn't live in, in a home with stacked stones or bricks. She actually lived inside of a mountain. That's where she grew up. And it was kind of dug in. And so you can imagine how dark it would get at nighttime. <laughs> And then you can imagine how bright it would get when all of a sudden, poof, uh, an angel would appear. Go back to the other one, Chris, and we'll keep it on that one for the rest of the sermon. And so I have often, and I've been there twice now, I've often looked at this picture and tried to imagine, I want you to do the same, but try to imagine this, this place being completely dark, and all of a sudden, an angel appears, and the glory of God is shining through that angel so bright that it lights up the entire space. That, of course, is what we want from our Christmas season, right? We want something to break into our darkness, to break through the ordinary and to see a kind of glow in our Christmas season. Some of you maybe can testify to the sensing of an angel. Maybe you have felt the presence of an angel. Maybe you thought that you had a stranger one time and you thought maybe you were conversing with an angel itself. Or maybe you feel like you've actually seen one, a live angel. If I were to poll the audience, it would be interesting to hear what you would say. But the truth is that there are a lot of misconceptions about angels. I mean, a lot of them. There was this uh, group of religious hermits outside of, uh, just right near the Dead Sea, outside of Jerusalem. They called themselves the, the Essenes. They were a community of about 70. And they actually believed that in the final days, which were coming soon, this is in Jesus' time, that the angels would come down and they would pick up literal weapons, bows and arrows, and there would be a spiritual battle between the forces of evil and these angels. And you can see these angels you know, getting ready for battle, but that really isn't scriptural. Uh, angels are warriors, but they're warriors with truth and compassion. It's often thought that angels are just kind of robotic beings sort of doing God's will, but in truth, the scripture tells us that angels have free will. They choose to serve God. They do so joyfully. We only know of a, a few angels who chose not to. I won't say his name, but Satan. <laughs> that was a church lady. Oh, okay. <laughs> also, there is this belief that we all have guardian angels. Well, that is true in a sense, but we're not really, uh, not really biblical in a way. The Bible says that angels are countless. They're as numerous. They're so numerous that you can't even count on. There's so many angels. So in a way, we do, but it's not just one angel. It's probably several angels that are looking after ourselves. But our angelic imagination has been shaped primarily not by Scripture per se, but more by pop culture, wouldn't you say? Remember that old TV show, Touched by an Angel? It came on in the 90s with Della Reese. Is that her name? Yeah, yeah. And that was basically a hallmark, a hallmark movie with angels, <laughs> if you remember that show. But in that show there, you know, at the end of each episode, it was the same thing. The angel would reveal itself to the person they were trying to help, right? You remember that? Uh, that is not necessarily true in our world. We don't have see angels revealing themselves constantly everywhere. Their presence to us is much more subtle. But we also see a lot of art, a lot of kitschy art about angels. We may be familiar with those paintings of little babies and big chubby cheeks and the little wings and, and they're, you know, they're huddled together. Well, that's not really biblical either. There's no example of big uh, angels with chubby cheeks. Uh, there's also a movie on. It's on almost every day now. It's, it's a Wonderful Life. Have you seen that movie? Probably all of you maybe. There's a, an angel in that movie, Clarence. Clarence the angel. And he's got that line. You know the line, right? Every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. Well, that's not scriptural. Don't believe that, okay? Uh, if you're going to ring in bells and giving out wings, it ain't going to work. That's not something that we believe. But, but what they do get right is this prevailing sense that there is an innocence to them, but most importantly, a, a deep kind of compassion for humanity. And so in the scriptures, we meet three angels. We meet Gabriel. We meet Michael. And then we meet Satan. But Gabriel is most prominent in the Christmas story. Gabriel reveals itself to Mary, and then to Joseph in a dream, and then we have the heavenly host, and then it reveals itself to Zechariah. And so Gabriel is making the rounds, right? And so we learn from Scripture, not from pop culture, that angels are servants. These are beings that live for eternity. They don't marry. 
they, they just serving God, they're married to Jesus in a way, and they minister to Christ when, when Christ was being tempted in the wilderness, when after the temptation of Christ, the angels came and, and tended to Christ, they massaged his shoulders and banned him and gave him food and water to drink, you know. We also learn from Scripture that angels take the shape of humans sometimes. When there is when Abraham and Sarah were being told that, that they were going to have a baby, they were visited by these three strangers, which were portrayed as kind of divine beings, taking the form of humans, but they were divine. Angels are not God, yet in their truest form, they shine the glory of God into the world, as we see with the angel Gabriel. Jesus said that angels take delight in any sinner who repents, and so we see the angels have this wonderful compassion. They, they rejoice when anyone turns to God and they repent. And finally, and most importantly, above all, the primary function of an angel is that they are a messenger of God. They have a message to deliver. They, are, they stand in that space between the divine realm and the earthly realm. They stand in that space between what is possible and what is impossible. They stand between human reality and God's reality. And what they do is they speak God's truth from God's reality into ours. That's what angels do. That is the point of having angels. That is the function of angels, not to look cute and to have wings. The point of the angel is to give us a message. And what is that message today? Well, it was in that last verse. Anything is possible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. Mary says, how can it be? How can I be pregnant? I'm a virgin. God says, anything is possible with God. Now, that is a good word, is it not? That is a good word for all of us as we strive for things that seem out of reach. Yet, that message doesn't resonate as well as maybe it used to. Partially because we have done so much as humanity. We've conquered high mountains. We've gone to space. We've gone to the moon. We've accomplished things that we never thought we could do. In fact, I, I just read an article a couple years ago. Uh, it, was, it was an article about how close we are to curing cancer. And, and the point of the article was that the person who's going to cure cancer or the group that's going to cure cancer not only have they been born, but they most likely have their PhDs by now. They're already doctors. And so we're that close now to, to curing this dreaded disease. And so the, the idea of impossibility is not something that we are necessarily as scared of as we used to be because we've done so many great things in our world. So when Mary says to Gabriel, how is it possible for this to happen? That doesn't resonate with us because we have people in our world who make a living off to find the impossible. It was Napoleon Bonaparte, Bonaparte excuse me, who said, the word impossible is not in my dictionary. That was Arnold Schwarzenegger. I wasn't French. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Nelson Mandela. I won't try Nelson Mandela. <laughs> but he said, it always seems impossible until it's done. And then Tommy Lasorda, the great Dodgers manager, said, the difference between the impossible and the possible lies in a man's determination. And there's all kinds of quotes like that. If you can do a Google, search, a Google search and spend three minutes and find a few of those, because we as humanity like to defy the odds. We like to do things that are hard to do. But it has also given us a very, um, I don't know, we feel a little bit more arrogant toward our own selves. We, we feel a little more arrogant about what we can do. We don't necessarily see the human limitation of things. And so it's good for us to be reminded that since the Renaissance, yes, we've made progress. We've had advances in medicine. Uh, we have strived to create more beautiful arts. Uh, modernity is a beautiful thing that has done so much good for people. Yet at the same time, with a single statement from an angel, Gabriel cut through all of that. Gabriel has cut through all of our years of building the knowledge and wisdom. And then we realize when Gabriel says nothing is impossible with God, it cuts through our understanding of what is possible and what is impossible. It's also very, um, I don't know, it's sort of humiliating in a way. To realize that there are things that we can't do? How often do we admit that to ourselves? 
How often do we admit to ourselves that we do have limits? We often tell our children, you can do anything in this world. Well, that's not exactly true. <laughs> Some people can, are really inclined to science and they can go to space one day. I am not. I was lucky to get out of algebra with the sea. That's not me. Yet an angel comes into the world and says to a teenage girl that everything is possible with God. And then we begin to rethink our limits. We begin to rethink what it is that we believe. And so we must strive. We must push ourselves to see a glow beyond the Christmas lights. To see a glow beyond Advent candles. To see a glow beyond Christmas lights displayed at people's homes. And we must find a deeper, more richer glow. The one of the angel Gabriel. A divine light. What is it that you want from Christmas this year? Do you want good Christmas lights? Do you want a tree that's nearly perfect? Or do you want to experience that angelic imagination? Do you want to know that all things are possible with God? Well, if so, then engage yourself in angelic possibilities. Pray for the impossible in your life and for others. Strive for things that other people have given up on. I heard it said one time, I've heard it so many times, I don't remember who said it first, but work like it's dependent on you, but pray like it's dependent on God. And that's what it means to strive for the impossible. Help people that others have given up on. Speak hope into hopeless situations. Engage yourself in angelic possibilities. Remember the words of the angel Gabriel that nothing is impossible with God. <clears throat> Remember, we don't have all the answers. There are things that we cannot do. But with God's help, all things are possible. Christmas happens when the impossible happens. That is the true glow of Christmas. It's not the lights. <laughs> it's not the Advent candles even. The true glow of Christmas comes from a belief that all things are possible. Will you pray with me now? <clears throat> God, help us to see the glow of your son Jesus this Christmas. Help us to remember the words of the angel this Christmas who told us that all things are possible and help us to live inside an angel's imagination. Lord, help us now as we are just days away from celebrating the birth of your son, help us to pray for the impossible, to strive for the impossible, to believe in the impossible, and to believe that all things can be done through you. Lord, help us to be believers, and bless us this Christmas by seeing the glow of your son, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.